Hi guys and welcome to the next lesson on the famine. Today we're going to be looking at the consequences of the famine. So there's quite a lot we need to go through in this lesson. It's going to be probably a slightly longer video. I'm imagining this is going to run to about 16, 17 minutes rather than the usual 40 and 15. Okay, so it's quite a lot of where material to get through so just make sure you're listening to all the different consequences it's really important that you're able to talk about all the consequences of the famine that we're going to go through today so just to start off today i want you to just have a look at this graph now this graph is in your booklet and we have seen it before earlier in our looking at the famine i want to, and i think we looked at sorry earlier when we looked at um how population was growing in 1700 so this graph is something we've come across a number of times what i want you to tell me here so i want you to think about this from the information given here what is one of the most immediate significant consequences of the great hunger in ireland so i'm going to ask you to pause here for you know 10 to 15 seconds and just have a look at this think about it you should be able to see quite quickly what the main one of the most immediate consequences of the famine is Okay, so the consequence that most of you are going to notice is this red line over here, this steep, steep decline in population. So we can see in 1700s that the population is growing, 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 goes really, really rapidly here in the from about 1780, 1790 up to 1845. Really, really rapid, rapid growth of population. And then suddenly there's dramatic fall in these few years. Uh, from 1845 up to 1850 you can see this you know steep dramatic decline and it's even labeled here as great famine and then we also notice that the population continues to fall over the next number of decades right up until the middle of the 20th century when it slowly starts to rise again and we know ourselves that even and we can see from the graph even by 2000 and now in 2020 we're still nowhere near the population that ireland was in the uh, pre-famine times okay but we're going to look at that a bit more later on so first thing we noticed the immediate impact was the population drop okay so today's lesson is all about exploring the short and long-term consequences of the great hunger so uh, what i'm going to be going through now for the next while is the different consequences okay i'm going to go through six different major consequences of the famine now, this is not everything that we need to know about the famine, about what happened after the famine. In our next lesson, we're going to be looking at something called the Irish Diaspora. And this comes from uh, the emigration. So when all the people of Ireland left over the years of the famine and in the decades following the famine, they went off to other countries, particularly the particularly the US, and they had a huge impact around the world. So we are going to be looking at that impact and how it relates to the famine in our next lesson. Today, we're just gonna be looking at the famine itself and the direct immediate consequences, or things are, um, yeah, these short-term and long-term, but things are very, very directly, you know, draw links to the famine. Okay, so at the end of this, what I'm gonna ask you be asking you to do is there's a table on teams, and I'm gonna be asking you to rank each of the different six effects and explain to me why you think each of them, was, uh, which ones are most important, which ones you consider to be less historically important. Now this is an opinion piece, but it is going to be asking you to think about it based on the facts of what I'm discussing here. Okay, so thinking about it, you're gonna be asked for two to three sentences for each of those tasks, for each of those uh, consequences, explaining why you placed it, where you placed it. Okay, so the first consequence we're going to look at is the fall in population. Now, as we've already said with this graph, we can see the steep, steep fall in population. So in the year 1845, we have a population of around 8.2 million people on the island of Ireland, which is a very, very uh, significant population uh, compared to if we look at the entirety of the United Kingdom, Ireland, the island of Ireland takes up about one third population of the entire of the British Isles, so between the island of Britain, so Scotland, England, Wales, and then we look at Ireland as well. If we use look at the United Kingdom of the two islands, Ireland is one third of the population. Now, if we compare that to modern times, in uh, Britain. I believe the population is around sixty-six million now. I could be, you can check that up now, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I believe it's around 66 million. 
what I do know for definite is that there's a huge difference between the population of Ireland. So Ireland's got about, um, on the island, around 6 million in the Republic, about just under 5 million at the moment. So now, if the two, when we compare the countries, we see that Ireland's population is minuscule compared to the population of the island of Britain. So the famine had a huge effect here. We went from being a third of the population of two islands. Now, if you combine the populations, Ireland would be less than 10% of the two. Okay, so a significant decrease in population. And this is a long-term effect. So we see from this red line here, the population immediately drops very significantly, very rapidly. So we go from 8.2 down to just over 6 million. Okay, and we know that about a million of these people some estimates go up to a million and a half died during these years where uh, and another million at least emigrated so if you two part two big reasons for this drop population but it is very significant after the famine we see the population continue to fall over decades and decades and this is largely due to continued emigration that life in ireland has changed there is no the poverty, the, poor, the poverty is not going to, is this level of poverty for people living in poverty doesn't really exist anymore. There's not a place in society for the cottier class, which has been all swiped out, which we'll look at in a second. Um, and so there just isn't as many, as much work for people to say. People are doing work on larger farms. We don't have this huge mass of people on small plots of land. And so the population continues to fall and fall and fall due to emigration, due to lowering birth rates, um, and continues a uh, very difficult time of life for the people of Ireland, continues to be very, very harsh. And we know even up to the 1870s and 1880s, when we looked at Parnell and we've seen the Land League, the people of Ireland are still struggling to have enough land to be able to keep themselves going. So do not think for a moment that the famine after the famine that life got much much better and that the cost the people the people of ireland were suddenly in a better situation with more land they definitely weren't throughout this the rest of the uh, 19th century so up the 1870s 1880s and beyond this there is huge huge issues in ireland in terms of the amount of land that people are living on and people being not able to sustain themselves still being forced to pay very very high rents you know huge amounts of issues with this Okay, even down where um, I come from, down in Gorey and Wexford, uh, up one of the mountains, there's a thing called an eviction stone. It's just a memorial to, in the 1870s or 1880s, I can't remember which one it is, there was a huge mass eviction by the landlord of the people living on this land because of rent issues. And this is just an exam one example of a very continuous trend of the landlord class continuing to hold control and the poor, the poorer people continuing to live on a very low means, um, working directly for their food. And, you know, if the, if another famine had occurred, if another blight had occurred, or if another situation occurred, we could have seen huge deaths again. This social inequality is definitely not gone by the end of the famine. And so huge drop in population as a result of the famine. We also have this issue of the cottier class, and we talked about how um, almost 4 million people in Ireland were living as cottiers, and these are the people who are most affected by the famine. So this social class is very, very badly affected. It's almost decimated by the famine, okay? and there's a number of reasons for this. So these are the people who are starving most. This is where most of the deaths are coming from. This, These are the people who, um, are emigrating because they just don't have anything to keep them in Ireland. But we also have a big change in farming practices, which links in with this. Okay, And what happens here is that this living on one acre of land lifestyle is almost, it's, it's not, it's seen as a problem and it's not really continued. The land that was vacated by the cottiers during the famine is taken by their neighbors and so small these smaller farms are growing back into larger farms we get rid of the subdivision of land okay this practice of subdividing land is uh is pushed away this cultural practice and it's brought into the 
system of the eldest son inheriting. But of course then if only the eldest son is inheriting land, the other children are being forced to emigrate because there is nothing to keep them here, which links back into our fallen population. So you can see how all these consequences are quite linked to each other. And this graph here is just going to show you how this um, is affected. So you see on the le on the um, vertical axis, 100, 200, 300, 400, this is the number of thousands, so 300,000 uh, number of holdings so of uh, one to five acres in 1841. And I would say that's actually probably a conservative estimate, to be honest, um, very conservative. Whereas in 1851, you can see these tiny holdings are very much decreased, okay? So the amount of people living on one to five acres is hugely decreased here, okay? People living on five to 15 acres, now that's a more substantial piece of land, still decreasing. And the people living on 30 plus acres of land, there's a huge increase in this. So the general farmers, there's less of these very, very poor people living on the land with very little land and a big increase in people with kind of slightly larger farms. This comes from the fact that so much of the land was vacated that the land became, was taken over by the neighbours who survived famine. Okay, so definitely the cottier class and the changing farming practices is a big, big consequence. We also see that Ireland changes a lot from a, a land where crops are grown over to pasture, so over to a lot more animals being kept on the land. So you have a huge increase in cattle and sheep being kept on the land in Ireland rather than all of the land being used to grow crops such as potatoes, etc. Okay, so the practices, the way you're farming itself changes as well. Okay, so big, big changes into agricultural, rural life of the country. We have a significant increase in anti-British feeling after the famine. So before the famine, you could say that a lot of Ireland wouldn't have been overly politicised. People were living uh, hand to mouth. They were just working to feed themselves and stay alive. So maybe weren't overly involved in politics. We know we, of course, we have Daniel O'Connell, who was very, very popular, but he was, you know, quite an exceptional person and really brought this about, brought this uh, interest in politics about. And we have the Catholic emancipation and everything like that. But Ireland is very much part of Britain at the time and there's very there's not a huge amount being there is definitely movements but very unsuccessful movements and we see that robert emmett's rebellion other rebellions in the early years the rebel, there's a rebellion itself within the time of the famine and are very they're quite small rebellions okay and people are just living by them you know trying to get by there was a huge increase in anti-British sentiment that comes about after the famine. And the people running these uh, rebellions, the people organising rebellions, so the Fenian movement, which comes about, and then later on with the rising in 1916, etc. There's a huge use of the famine as a reason for this anti-British feeling. So people such as Michael Davitt, who was one of the founders of the Land League alongside Charles Stuart Parnell, and uh, people like uh, Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, who was a leader of the Fenian movement, a very violent movement, remember, who were linked with uh, Parnell and the Land League. These two men have experiences of the famine. They watched their families die during the famine. They came from poor social classes and were very much affected by the famine and by the government's lack of response to the, the um, hardship of the people in Ireland. And this spurs them to want to get rid of the British influence in Ireland. And they use imagery and they use the facts of what happened in the famine to gain support for their causes. Right? And they definitely get, they capture the people's imagination and the heart of the people, and they get a lot more support for their movement against the British from this. And you see this mural, and it's a much more modern mural, um, but it's talking about, it claims that Britain, uh, there was a genocide uh, against the Irish, and it compares it to the Holocaust. Now, these are quite extreme terms, but you can see how the famine is being used to legitimise uh, an anti-British feeling within Ireland, okay, and you can see over 1.5 million dead, again, using the extremes of a famine, whether justified or not, to support their violent movements against the British, against the government 
for, of Britain having influence on Ireland. So this is a huge influence of the famine, a huge consequence of the famine as well. We have a decline in the Irish language, and I'm going to show you a few maps here, and these maps are in the booklet as well. And you can see on the left-hand side in 1800, the vast majority of the island is speaking Irish. And now in the 1800s as well, this is a very, very highly populated area of the island, the west side. Okay, nowadays the east side of the eastern coast of the country is much more populated. In the 1800s, the western side of the island was very, very populated. Now, by 1850, by the time that we're coming to the end of the Great Hunger, we already see a big decline in the Irish language. This, there's a number of reasons why this is happening, and going up to 1900, you see how massively declined it is, and especially up to 2000, you know, in our modern world, very few isolated places that are still uh, sorry, let's go back. That are still speaking Irish as a native tongue. Um, so this decline comes from a number of reasons. Um, with the Act of Union, there's a few laws passed to try and discourage the Irish language, to try and encourage people to speak English. Um, when the time of the famine comes, when people are looking for work, the rest of the world doesn't speak Irish, and when they're emigrating to America, Canada, Australia, the UK, they need to speak English, and so English is seen as a more useful language to them than Irish. There was active work on the part of the British government to discourage the teaching of Irish and to discourage people speaking this, and there's been great literature, um, there's a great play called Translations by Brian Friel, which examines this phenomenon of people of the different languages and the loss of the Irish language and the Anglicization of Ireland. But we see that very significantly over the course of 200 years, the Irish language is forcibly uh, brought down across the country. And this is why we still see Irish be with just such a, a strong focus on the Irish language within the Irish education system now, is trying to reverse this process of losing the native tongue. Okay, But definitely the famine and the emigration and the deaths and the need to go and find work in other parts of the world is a significant factor on why people moved away from the Irish language because they just simply had to in order to survive. Okay. The final consequence I want to speak about today, and I know I've been speaking for quite a while now, okay, but it's emigration. Okay. Emigration is a significant part of Irish history. The Irish have always tended to go to other countries to travel the world and to emigrate and simply not come back. So if we look here, you'll see that in the 1840s and 1850s, you can see on the graph a huge spike in emigration significantly to the US. Okay, Canada also has, you know, a very um, significant place here as well. Okay, so a huge amount of emigration out of the country. Okay, so you see 1.2 million people leaving around here, okay, huge, huge numbers leaving the country. And this is continuing the whole way up into the 19, into 20th century, so 1911, 1920, we still see, this is where we start to see emigration uh, decline, but still 200,000 people emigrating, significant amount, okay. And this is largely caused by, by aspects to do that are related to the famine. So if we link back to the changing in farming practices, the lack of subdivision of land, we're linking back to the loss of language. There's a huge loss of uh, culture within Ireland. Now, this does try to come back with the sort of cultural revival in the 1880s and 1890s, which we will look at in our next unit. But you can see that the Irish people are simply leaving the country. This will link into the next section. So in our next lesson, we're going to look at the Irish diaspora. So I'm going to go into this in a bit more detail. But it's very significant. The Irish population continues to fall due to emigration, and these people create what is known as the Irish diaspora, which is the people around the globe who can connect their history and their genealogy back to Ireland. And we have some a huge Irish diaspora, it's claimed to be about 70 million people that can claim their lineage back to Ireland. People including presidents of America, people all over Australia, you will see Irish culture has gone out and permeated the world. But a lot of this again links back to what will happen in the famine, forcing people out of the country. The debt, the starvation, the hunger, the destitution in Ireland during those famine years and the continued poverty after the famine is one of the reasons why this emigration is so, so high for such a long time. Okay, so I've gone through a lot of information there. Now, all of this information is in your booklet under the section Consequences of Famine. 
Okay, so you can find all of this information there as well. So if you missed anything, you know, go back through the video, pause, go back and look, read, listen to it again. The task for today is there is a table which I've uploaded on Teams alongside this video. What I want you to do is for each of these consequences, I want you to rank them. So which one do you think is the most significant of the consequences? Put that as number one. And then one or two sentences explaining in detail why this is significant. Okay, I want detailed answers here. Right? This is significant because this, this, and this. These are the effects it had. Okay, All right, this is how I can see this in the modern world. Okay, so you're ranking one to six the whole way down. Which do you think is the most significant and a legitimate reason for why you think that is the most significant of these consequences? Okay, thanks for listening, guys. Any questions, please just email me.